Hello, 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 hello. How are you, everyone? And welcome, welcome. We are going through all the ups and downs for Star Trek Picard Season 3, Episode 1, The Next Generation. Before we jump off and do everything, we just have to give a massive thank you to everyone who helps to make our trip to the premiere in Hollywood, which is a ridiculous sentence to say. Still slightly overwhelmed by it, still slightly pink in the face from it as well. Yes, I have read your comments sunscreen. We gave our quick, quick feedback there just at the end of the premiere. We had some lovely special guests join us for that video. So much fun. But this video is going to be the full, completely spoiler including ups and downs. All the spoilers all the way through. So you have been given fair warning. Before we go even further than that, I just want to say thank you so much as well to our editor, Chris. I don't know what time this video has dropped at, but I know this man hasn't slept. So just everyone, make sure you go and drop a nice big thank you over on his Twitter, which is at EditChrisEdit. Depending on how you thought of how season one began and ended, how season two began and ended, I liked them. I did. I, I, there's a lot I like in each of the seasons. But I will say to you emphatically, Third time's the charm. Our first up of the episode goes to the dedication. Annie Wershing, of course, played the Borg Queen in season two of Star Trek Picard, and we recently lost her to cancer. The fact that she was remembered with love by those who knew her and those who worked with her, and that she was included in this episode with this dedication, was just something that we really wanted to honor as well. The episode, of course, begins with that new Star Trek Universe logo that, you know, all new episodes are getting. And I'm going to give an up as well to the new Titan, which we see in the Universe logo. I have slightly more to say about the ship, but moving swiftly along, we get to In the 25th Century, which locks this down, first of all in terms of a year, but also complete tie back to the Wrath of Khan. Up from me. While I'm at it, up for the font as well. We get this gorgeous panning through space and these nebula gases. Very, very, very like the opening of the very first episode of Star Trek Picard, Remembrance, which then leads to the reveal of the SS Elios, which is the ship bearing a very familiar doctor. Once the reveal happens that Dr. Crusher is the one who's going to open the season, I just want to take a very quick note to jump on that voice of that computer for the SS Elios. Now, there was a little bit of talk just before the season began, the fact that Majel Barrett Roddenberry's voice was not going to be used for the ships in this season. V various reasons for that behind the scenes, but I want to really highlight the voice that they do use. Amy Earhart is the voice of the computer of the SS Elios in this season. She's been in Star Trek before. She was a Vulcan delegate in the episodes Demons and Terra Prime in Star Trek Enterprise. She is also a distant cousin of Amelia Earhart. Yes, that Amelia Earhart. She is also the wife of Terry Metalis. The reveal of Dr. Crusher is a little bit surprising in one respect because, you know, what is a doctor's pledge? Do no harm. What do we see her doing? Grabbing a phaser rifle and engaging in a firefight with these aliens who are boarding her ship. Gates McBadass gets an up from me straight away. One of the great crimes of Generations First Contact, Insurrection and Nemesis was that Gates McFadden was effectively relegated down to kind of cameo status. Whereas she is front and center here. The entire drive of this first episode is to get to her. She reaches out to Picard. She is shooting people at point blank range. It's all about her in this episode. And it's so crucial to know that this is the direction the season is taking. Now, despite the fact that she is able to dispatch both of her attackers, they do get in a couple of good shots. She goes and immediately locks the door on other person who's on the ship and sends a coded message to a certain bald English Frenchman. This, of course, then leads into our new opening title card. Gorgeous Jerry Goldsmith theme playing over that. And then it leads into the Jeff Russo theme from seasons one and two. As it stands, it's just that title card and then the name of the episode itself. That's an up. 
great to see the name of the episode at the beginning of these again because I know Lower Decks and Prodigy does it but Picard, Discovery and Strange New Worlds up to this point haven't done it. Now this is something I actually really missed from Star Trek of years gone by so I love seeing that those are back again. We then arrive once again at Chateau Picard and we see BOOM! Laris is back for season three. I think I was quite clear when I said that I would riot if Laris didn't return for this season. So I am so, so happy to see her back. And it seems again that their relationship, Laris and Picard, is going well. In fact, they're thinking of moving off world and they're going to a place that has a lovely bar that has a great view of sunset. Also great to see as well how well they work together. We look to Jean-Luc as sort of the elder statesman, but actually, you know, Laris possibly has some years on him and it's good to see that dynamic between them and how they bounce off each other and how she, you know, will listen to his nonsense, but she'll hold him to task as well. It's really enjoyable. We go through the room and there's a whole load of Easter eggs. Honestly, I'm gonna need you to grab a coffee for the cetacean observations of this video. I'm just letting you know that in advance, okay? But this scene with Laris, it's obviously setting up the fact that Picard is in retirement now and, you know, he's ready to settle down. And he even goes as far as to say, you know, he wants, he doesn't need to have a legacy. He wants to look forward, which of course is cue for the message from Crusher to arrive. Now, a few hours obviously go by, it changes from daytime to nighttime, and his combadge goes off, which is a lovely return for the TNG era combadge. Crusher gives him this warning, and he's all, oh no, I should do stuff, and then he goes and talks to Laris, and I have a, I have a down. So, clearly, this scene is setting up that not only is he going to go and attempt to rescue Crusher, but he's going to do it with Laris's blessing, which is, which is brilliant. However, the dialogue so clearly hammers across the point of like, see you in episode 10, Laris. Uh, kind of like, uh, so it's like, yeah, I'll be waiting for you at the bar with a drink for you as the sun is going down and we bought a boat called the Live Forever and I've only one day left to retirement. That was a little bit of a down for me, I have to say, because it tells me straight away, it's like, oh, hi Orla Brady, bye Orla Brady. We lead then into one of the scenes that just made me smile from start to finish, which is Riker in 10 forward. Jonathan Frakes very nearly steals this episode for me. He's both better than he's ever been, he's a little bit different, he's still exactly the same. This is the Riker that we've wanted since Nemesis wrapped, probably even before that. Because while I really loved what they did with Riker in season one in Nepenthe, this is sort of the, a little bit adventurous Riker back again and it's great to see. Love seeing the banter that he has with the barmaid in 10 forward. Love the fact that Eagle Moss is canon. Everyone don't worry maybe Eagle Moss is a bit rocky now at the moment in 2023 but by the 25th century they're gonna be back with a bang. I nearly cried with laughter when he asked why there was so many Enterprise D's left behind the bar and the barman, barmaid answers nobody wants the fat one. I was like, what? I giggled, I giggled ever so. And then just at the perfect time, Picard rocks up beside him and he's like, you know, Admiral, can, can you believe what she's saying? This is ridiculous. Uh, Picard unfortunately is not there to discuss toys. He is there of course, to discuss the message that Beverly sent. He is able with Riker's help to decode the coordinates that she sent him. She used the keyword Helbert. He had no idea what this was in reference to. Riker is able to tell him, yeah, that was something we talked about when you were incapacitated. And by incapacitated, I mean destroying a fleet of Federation starships. It's a nice nod to best of both worlds without being too over the top. You know, Picard just goes, ah, look cute, it's okay. And we don't have to have the big, massive emotional music or anything. They accept it, they move on to the next scene. This scene clearly sets up that whatever Picard is getting himself into, Riker's going to be with him every step of the way. Another thing I love about this episode. Cut now to the planet that has a very mysterious name. No idea where it could have come from. 
and we get our Rafi story for the episode. Initially, it looks as if she's relapsed. She is going up to an Orion contact and she's looking for drugs and information. She says she's after falling off the wagon again. She says her girlfriend's left her. Our first indirect reference to a certain XB. She also says that Starfleet kicked her out. But if she can get some information, she might be able to buy her way back in. The Orion contact is basically having none of it. But here's a load more money. And the Orion just says, the red lady, shut up and get away from me now. Drung out, she wanders away and, and then stands up and pulls out a communicator and says, Commander Rafi Musgar of Starfleet Intelligence replying with this information and i like that i was concerned going into this season what they were going to do with rafi for a few reasons one is that we knew elnor wasn't coming back would that leave rafi at a bit of a loose end there has been a bit of a back and forth about you know is she okay is she not okay what are we doing this week and i'm just i'm glad that what they did is they took that expectation they took that fear they put it front and center and then they went don't worry about it. We have bigger plans for Ruffy. Now, what those plans are, we'll have to wait for a few minutes because then we cut to the... Oh my God, Space Dock. How good does this look? It is our original Space Dock and it's our updated for the 25th century Space Dock. It is beautiful. I love that as we go in, we get some shots of some other ships around. Keep an eye out for cetacean observations. And we fly in and we get our big reveal of the Titan. Now, we've seen the Titan in the trailers. There has been so much talk online about this, about that, about side to side, about up and down, about back in time. This is a Neo-Constitution class. We have a familiar overall shape of callbacks to Matt Jeffrey's original design and updated design for Star Trek The Motion Picture, but it's also brought it into a more modern era. It's blocky, I will say that, that deflector dish, it's quite encased, and I think that's where a lot of the, a lot of the initial kind of hmm came from. It's because we're quite used to seeing quite rounded, you know, star drive sections and sections around the deflector dish. I have by completely and utterly come around to it. I really, really like it, you know, because I think what helped was seeing it in profile, seeing it all around. I think it's quite a lovely design. Clearly in, you know, based on the Shangri-La class, um, if you check out model maker Bill Krause's Twitter, you will see the evolution of the Titan. Um, perhaps as the season goes on, I'll go into a little bit more of how they came to be, where they're at with this, because honestly, if I go into too much detail about it now, Chris will kill me and this video is going to hit three hours long. So we do have our gorgeous panning scene around the Titan. There's some other ships in there as well. Again, I'll come back to it. And then we're on board. You've got Admiral Picard flying his colors. You've got Captain Riker because Riker had this great idea of, we'll pretend to do a surprise inspection ahead of this upcoming Frontier Day, and we'll use that inspection to sort of con the ship out to the area Beverly sent us to. It's outside Federation space. We'll deal with that as we go. Basically, Riker's like, adventure, 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 and Picard's like, I just want to get there. The doors open, and Commander Annika Hansen is standing there waiting for them. Now, up... And perhaps not for the reason you think. You might assume I'm going to be like, oh, oh, brilliant. Seven's back. Straight away, we find out there's a different feeling on this ship. She corrects Admiral Picard really quickly by saying, no, no, no. Captain Shaw prefers I go by Annika Hansen. Perhaps you've heard of the phrase of dead naming. It's when particularly a transgender person transitions from perhaps who they were to who they now are and deliberately using the name they went by previously is referring to their dead name. Dead naming, that's where that comes from. When it's accidental, that's one thing, but when it's deliberate, it is a very pointed statement that the current person is not accepted. So this scene sets up in just a sentence or two that Captain Shaw will not accept seven of nine aboard his ship. He does allow Annika Hansen. Straight away, you get the feeling that something is off with Captain Shaw. 
There's also the fact that Captain Shaw is not there to welcome an admiral and cap former captain of the Titan to the ship. So they're walking through a guard of honor and Picard has to act the part. So he stops to straighten a crewman's, uh, a trill crewman's com badge and does a little <laughs> and, and they walk off together. Um, who's that bloke watching them? He's a bit shifty, isn't he? They arrive on the bridge, which is a beautifully redesigned version of the bridge of the Stargazer. We still have those curved uh, Elkar panels, the Elkars themselves. Oh, go on, it's gorgeous. Again, as the season goes on, I'll spend a bit of time going through each of the bridge crew in detail because, again, runtime. But there's two I want to single out straight away just in this. First of all, I want to give a shout out to our lovely bald Vulcan, Stephanie Cheskowski. I really hope I've pronounced that correctly. If I have not, please let me know and I will amend. We also have, ugh, this just makes me smile, we have Sydney LaForge, uh, who just, we, we meet her with this demented smile on her face, to the fact where Picard turns to Seven and goes, is there something wrong with that ensign? And then the entire scene plays as an obvious homage to meeting Demora Sulu on the bridge of the Enterprise B. We even get the fact that Kirk doesn't recognize Sulu because so much time has gone by. Picard doesn't recognize Sidney LaForge because so much time has gone by. It's very much, you want to be, you know, when you're an officer on a bridge, I assume, having not been one, but you want to be respected in your position. You want people to take you seriously. What you don't want is your dad's old mate to go, Crash LaForge, that was you! <laughs> you crashed a shuttle twice! <laughs> oh. She takes it in her stride, or she maybe the smile dips by a couple of molars, but you can tell this is a very friendly reunion. Oh, it's just so heartwarming to see this entire scene. We then get, you know, take us out of space dock, and <laughs> absolutely, that's getting an up because, I mean, come on. Hello, Star Trek 3, how are you? Activating aft thrusters ahead one quarter impulse. It's like, are you doing thrusters or are you, are you doing impulse? I thought they were mutually exclusive. Apparently not. However, I must say that regulations stipulate thrusters only while in space dock. Finally, we get the introduction of Captain Shaw. Todd Stashwick is flipping brilliant with actually a relatively small amount of screen time in this episode. The first introduction is you see a little bit of wine being poured into a glass, then you get this uh, lovely blue food being eaten, you get a little bit of a dip into a garnish of sauce on the side, and he's enjoying his dinner nicely, and he doesn't stand when Admiral Picard walks into the room. Seven does the introductions, and Picard asks, oh, I'm sorry, are, are we late? And he said, no, your reputation is so big, it entered the room before you did. Well then, so Shaw's a bit of a dick, isn't he? The entire scene plays out like a bait and switch. There's a lot of discomfort and there's a lot of humor in it. Riker has to try and convince him to bring the Titan to the writing system. Shaw is a by the book person. He, he says like, ah, oh, well this surprise inspection, there's not gonna be as many explosions as you're used to. They're not gonna crash. Riker tries to engage him in a captain to captain on a bit of a Titan to Titan chat. Uh, Shaw does say like, you know, ah, oh, you're the one who was responsible for all the bebop in the ship's computer. And Riker's like, oh, you're not a fan of jazz. And Shaw's just like, I need structure. We'll be having none of your freewheeling. Picard tries to ease the tension. He brings a gift of a bottle of Chateau Picard and Riker tries to go, oh, wouldn't it be great? You know, we want to change course and you get bragging rights and the Titan gets to get out to see new places ahead of again this frontier day. It'd be great. And Shaw's is like, ha, 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 no. Sorry, come again? Shaw flat out refuses to change direction to suit Riker and Picard. But he goes one further. Seven tries to speak up, but he turns to her and says, basically, shut your mouth and stop sticking up for your ex-Borg friend. And that's when ice could form on the table. All niceties are dropped at this point. Shaw leaves the room, pausing long enough to pat Riker so condescendingly on the shoulder, and away he goes. Riker and Picard, they sort of tip their hand a little bit to Seven, as they are walking out, they talk about, oh God, we need to get to the writing system, and Seven's standing there just behind them. And you can see it written all over her face. She's like, uh, I'm gonna get in trouble for this, aren't I? We then cut to 
up. You have Admiral Picard and Captain Riker on bunk beds. Now this scene looks like it was taken right out of the enlisted crew member scenes from Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. But also, Captain Riker is in socks, which is why this is my Latinum up. We do a quick cut back to Raffi. Raffi is trying to get in touch with her handler, her, you know, her contact with Starfleet Intelligence. The handler at the moment is just text on a screen. Raffi is quite frustrated. She's been undercover for months. She's trying to get more answers. She has received this tip about this red lady. We know no context. You know, we had in here in Trek Culture Terrace, we were like, you know, are we getting the Red Angel? Is this happening? Are we getting a sequel to Discovery season two? This handler is very blunt and denies her, and denies her again. And she starts to get very frustrated, and you know, they bring up her service history, plenty of Easter eggs in there, and remind her that she's a warrior. Deny, deny, warrior. Aboard the Titan, Riker and Picard are invited to join Seven of Nine in the Observation Lounge, where she asks to speak freely, and they say okay, and she says, tell me what's going on or I'm airlocking you both. Now remember, Riker and Seven haven't met before, before this day. You know, he's like, how dare you speak to an admiral like that? And she goes, I'm talking to my friend. And Riker, you could see it in him. He's like, it took me a while to be able to speak to him like that. And they, there's a little bit of an explanation of Seven's backstory with Starfleet about how Jean-Luc and Janeway convinced her to join. And I'm loving what they're doing with Seven this season so far. It wasn't a simple flip a switch, now I'm a Starfleet officer. And I like that. And there is a callback to the Fenris Rangers as well. And then there's the reveal that she has changed Shaw's orders and brought them to the writing system. And she says, look, you have four minutes, get a shuttle, go. Shaw, because, you know, he can only sleep when everything is absolutely perfect, wakes up, sees the writing system through the window and is like, oh, hell no. Gets up, runs to the bridge and basically says, Commander, you just loyaltyed your way out of a career. He quickly demands to find out where are Riker and Picard, and LaForge tells her, well, we've got an unauthorized shuttle launch there. Shaw is not best pleased. Riker, however, is having a great time. He turns to Picard and says, I really like that Seven character. As the shuttle's flying toward the Helios, which is just outside of Federation space, they pull up Beverly's most recent Starfleet medical records and down. This is where there's an issue with the fact that we have 4K and we can zoom in is because we see that there are two entries on this list. Uh, one is from TNG Season 7, and one says she was injured with some falling rocks and debris. This was the one who was the head of Starfleet Medical the last time we saw her. They're zooming in toward the ship. Meanwhile, you've got Raffi, who's guiding toward District 7 because she's figured out that the Red Lady is in fact a reference to a statue, statue outside of a Starfleet recruitment center. She gets there just on time, to see this amazing portal weapon effectively beam this recruitment center out from underneath itself and then drop it back down on the surface. And I have to say, I was sitting there going like, oh shit, that one was good. That was definitely an up. Rafi finishes this episode going, oh dear God, we're in trouble. Riker and Picard, they board the Elios and they discover that there is in fact another person on board, as we knew from the opening scene. Ed Spilliers appears. Ed Spilliers appears. He manages to hold Riker at gunpoint while walking down into the bridge of this ship, where Beverly is in a stasis chamber. Riker does pull a gun on him, and they do manage to all talk each other down, especially when he introduces himself as Beverly Crusher's son. They're interrupted in their attempting to figure this out, by the arrival of a very large, very mean looking ship. Oh, that's an up. And you know what? We leave it there for this week. Now, will you take a walk and possibly a stool with you to Cetacean Observations? Mm -hmm. 
In this episode, we have, it's in the 25th century, we have lots of Jerry Goldsmith in the beginning of the episode. We have that nod to season one, Remembrance, the intro scene. We have a revelation that Beverly has continued to keep orchids, first seen in Cause and Effect, season five of TNG. We see the theater comedy and tragedy masks, which of course is a callback to the fact that she was directing theater on the Enterprise D. The log entry that we hear in the opening scene is from the best of both worlds, part one. It's the one that Picard makes while they're hiding in the nebula from the Borg. We have the song I Want to Set the World on Fire, which Fallout fans will remember very well. We see the Next Generation desktop computer. We see an award for Beverly for Core Coral I-5. She was able to help with the Firox virus. This is from the episode Allegiance. We see hyposprays. We see the belongings of Jack Crusher from the Stargazer. A little glass of Romulan ale. When we see Beverly for the first time, she's wearing a jacket that's definitely evocative of the away jacket from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. She cocks a phaser rifle like that which was first introduced in Star Trek First Contact. We see the hexagonal crates which always were around in any planet you went to in the next generation. The aliens who board the Elios. They speak in clicks, which reminds me of the aliens from Schisms. The encryption that Beverly uses goes with an encryption channel of 1701D. The opening credits play the First Contact theme, or at least Jerry Goldsmith's interpretation of the First Contact theme, with the Picard theme with Jeff Russo. The TNG font returns. Now, then we get the pining up of the Enterprise D painting. We get the fossil, which we often saw in Picard's ready room. We see the gold Enterprise C. We see the Promelian battle cruiser in a bottle. The gold Enterprise D is sitting on Picard's desk. The Bajoran bust logo is right beside it, and a gold Enterprise E is just a few feet away. The Enterprise E chair is sitting behind the desk with the Mintakan tapestry still at attached to it. Picard mentions wanting a bottle of Saurian brandy. He holds the Resican flute up at one point and sitting on his desk later on is a Curlin Nascius. Now we see TNG pads in his packing crates and also lovely crate of Chateau Picard. We see the return of the TNG uniform nice and packed up as he's looking for his com badge which is how Beverly is trying to contact him. He uses the authorization code Picard 47 Alpha Tan Tango, which is several references in once. The whole code is a references to First Contact, and of course 47 being the most frequent number to turn up since the next generation. As he's speaking to Laris, there's a Vulcan liar in the background. In 10 forward, we see the Eagle Moss Enterprise D, which is lovely. There's a Frontier Day poster behind Riker with the Enterprise Re or 1701 refit on it, Galaxy Class, Intrepid Class, NX-01, and the Enterprise B Excelsior refit. Of course, we get a name drop of Guinan and 10 forward itself. The Eagle Moss Voyager is there. There's an Andorian standing right behind Riker. Federation Class Dreadnought model is also on display in 10 forward. Now, for those of you who did collect Eagle Moss like I did, you'll know that there was no commercially released version of the Federation Class Dreadnought. It seems to have been either custom made for this episode or Maybe it was one of the ones that was on the way. There's a Tellarite sitting at the bar. There's bottles of Andorian ale behind the bar. They talk about Rigel 7. Now, while the next generation didn't really visit Rigel 7 on screen, if we read it, it's the birthplace of Lieutenant Bob Blackman from an episode of The Chase. Robert Blackman, of course, being the person who designed the next generation uniforms. We all the read the from season three onwards, I should say. It is also the location of the LaGrange colony, which we would only know if you watch the remastered version of Inheritance. Perhaps most importantly, there is the reference to the song Moon Over Rigel 7, which was suggested by Captain Kirk for their sing-along in Star Trek V The Final Frontier. We get the, the picture of Guinan and Crusher beside Riker and Picard. They are being watched by a shady fella who, as they walk away, he drops one of the attack wing Enterprise Ds into his drink. Then we go to Metallus Prime. We see Jat Vash weapons. We see an Orion in makeup, as opposed to the sort of plasticine look that we've seen before. There's talk of Daystrom off-site locations. Rafi is wielding a TOS-style communicator. Of course, Space Dock. We see a Sovereign-class ship piloting beside it. The shuttle pod is clearly a reef of the shuttle pod we saw in the motion picture. There's a Sutherland class ship that is sitting just outside and there's another one inside Space Dock as well. That of course is from Star Trek Online. We saw it back in season two. We're introduced or at least introduced much more clearly to the Reliant class which is the Star Trek Online version of the Miranda class as well. Lovely shot of that in Space Dock. We got the Titan Neo Constitution. We get the whistle as our Picard and Riker board the ship. In that hallway there's a Vulcan, a Trill, a Tellarite and an Orion. We also get a Hellion on the bridge. Now, this is from the episode Aquil, which is for the sixth season of The Next Generation, and I'm not going to lie, it's not a good episode. 
it's not a good episode. But it's great to see the alien race back again. There's also a Bajoran on the bridge as well. As the Titan is leaving space dock, we see a disco work bee is just flying past. And the music here is sort of a mashup between Jerry Goldsmith and James Horner. You have something that's quite similar to obviously Voyager, you've got First Contact, but also it seems like the theme from Star Trek 3 works its way in, which thematically works very well for piloting a ship out of space dock. They talk about raising the metaphasic shields and we have the blue food that Shaw is tucking into clearly a reference to the blue dinner scene from Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Shaw talks about the bebop to Purge, of course a reference to all of the jazz of Riker's background, and he makes a reference to former ex-Borgs. Now that's a bit of a below the belt dig. On board La Serena, when going through Raffi's service history, if we zoom in we see that she once was uh, chided for stalking Admiral Janeway, she then went to therapy on Beta Z, but she did receive decoration for valour and gallantry. Now that is exactly what Data had had received by the time of the court case in The Measure of a Man. Cutting to the bunk beds, which I've already upped, which are just fantastic, but also you get the, you hear the chimes that you heard on the Excelsior as well. So that is another deliberate reference to Star Trek VI, absolutely taken up there. We see JL and Janeway convinced Seven to join Starfleet. That's another up because that is a direct reference to the Stargazer comic that was released before season three. The Type 11 shuttle, or at least a slight refit of the title of Type 11 shuttle that was introduced in Star Trek Insurrection makes a return here. We get a freeze frame image of a Romulan warbird from season one of Star Trek Picard and there's talk of a Tal Shiar operative as well. Rafi is able to narrow down what's going on to operation number 8820-1701. There are then references to the Bajoran Gratitude Festival, which we remember from the episode Tears of the Prophets of Deep Space Nine. Then we get a reference to Empire Union Day. Empire Union Day was mentioned once before in the 1993 audiobook Power Klingon that was read by Michael Dorn and Mark Ockrand. Mark Ockrand, of course, invented effectively the Klingon language based on the few sounds that were made for Star Trek The Motion Picture. The bits in Klingon were written out, were read out by Mark Ockrand. And then of course there's Frontier Day itself. Frontier Day being the 250th anniversary of the formation of the Federation. If you zoom in, you will see the Pathfinder class Voyager B on screen. That's cool. That's cool. Now that also tells me that, you know, we know that there's a Voyager B at this point in time. So, you know, if one were to watch Star Trek Prodigy Season 2, one might be interested to find out what's going on with the Voyager A. Perhaps I've said too much. You see concept art for the Stargazer. You see pictures of United Federation of Planet Headquarters. You see Starfleet Academy. You then see Enterprise F for early decommission. Now, if you've been paying attention to Instagram, the Star Trek logs, it tells us that the Enterprise F is due for early decommission due to the Monfet Gambit. Monfet being the name of co-producer Christopher Monfet. We get, of course, a reference to Rachel Garrett, captain of the Enterprise C. There does seem to be an image of a Crossfield class ship down in the corner, which raises questions because the Discovery's been completely classified and the Glenn blew up after letting a guitar degrade run around and kill everyone, so not really memorable. Beverly's medical history, the what well, now I have to say. I did like the fact that of the two that I did complain about, one of them is from Genesis, that she got sprayed with an unknown venom and needed reconstructive surgery. Genesis was directed by Gates McFadden in season seven of The Next Generation. Riker talks about how her pulse ox is quite low and the display is very reminiscent of the original series, medical displays that we see. Shuttle docks with the Elios, very, very similar to how the Vulcan shuttle docked with the Enterprise 1701 in the motion picture. Uh, Ed Spillier's phaser, is very, very reminiscent of, it's like a hybrid between the original series phaser and the assault phaser from Star Trek's five and six. Now, then we move into the end credits and you would think, Sean, you're done, stop. Oh no, no, my friend. The first contact theme plays throughout. We get a schematic of a Burrell class bird of prey cloaking device. And then just a second later, we hear the sound of the cloaking device as well. We get a Elkar display of the hollow 10 forward from LA, so clearly a reference to the bar that they were in earlier on. We get a musical phrase. Bear with me. Marvel.
marvelous. Then we hover over the schematic of the USS Constance, which is a Constellation class ship that was reported missing on Stardate 4402.3. In fact, it was reported lost in action, and that Stardate is Wolf 359. Then we get to the uh, display of space dock, and around it are dotted several uh, registries. We have NCC 80107. Now, while that doesn't reference a specific ship, it is one of the Luna class vessels. Luna class, of course, being what the middle Titan was. There is a Defiant class ship, there's an Intrepid class, what looks like Constitution class. We also see the registry NCC 52136. That is the registry of the USS Appalachia, which is a Steamrunner class ship that was introduced in Star Trek First Contact. After that, we go to a schematic that shows the Voyager itself, USS Pioneer, the Enterprise A, and the USS Excelsior. Finally, that's it for this episode. Now, I, with the sheer amount of Easter eggs that are in there, I surely missed something. So by all means, please let me know. Please let me know. And go and make sure that you get in touch with us on social media, at Trek Culture on Twitter, at Trek Culture YT on Instagram. Now you can catch myself, at Sean Ferrick on the various socials. Make sure that you show some love to at Edit Chris Edit on Twitter and Instagram, because that man, no matter how tired you think I am right now, he's more tired because he's had to do all of this video and put it together. So show him a bit of love there. Everyone, thank you. What did you think of Star Trek Picard Season 3's first episode? Don't forget as well that Season 3, while it might be the close of Picard, it may not be the end of the road. If you want to get a little bit of what I'm talking about, check out our buddies over at SFX Magazine. Now, their most recent issue that just came out contains some cool interviews, one with Jonathan Frakes, which teases a future for Next Generation, and also with... Gates McFadden as well and their next issue which will be available probably by dropping you know the links will be in this video to either pre-order or order I wouldn't send you there if I wouldn't go there myself yous are awesome yous are wonderful whatever you do until I see you again will you just make sure that you live long and prosper everyone all of our friends around the world who are facing hard times know that there is a community here who is with you who loves you remember infinite diversity in infinite combinations we love you all Everyone, you have a good weekend. Make it so.